Welcome to Vanadium. Welcome to Vanadium. I'm Chris Rankin. The more I learn about this mad world, the more mysterious it seems. Dreams were the first bit of evidence for me that there was more to the world than meets the eye. Dreams seemed, and still seem to me, like the unmistakable signature of something mysterious, mystical, a sign that our conscious experience isn't necessarily just a momentary, insignificant flicker of light in the darkness. Dreams aren't like UFOs or other strange exotic phenomena. They're not rare or elusive. Dreams happen to practically everyone throughout their lives. There's no argument whether dreams exist. Infants dream, the elderly dream, nearly two thirds of the population report having recurring dreams. Dreams have been significant for me as long as I can remember. I had my first lucid dream when I was in the first or second grade. In lucid dreams, we become aware we're dreaming and can sometimes influence the content of the dream. My lucid experiences started when I was very young. The first time, I recall standing in the living room of my parents' house and somehow realizing that I was dreaming and that things around me weren't quite real. In that instant of realization, my feet gently lifted off the floor and I found myself floating across the room and down the stairs like a soap bubble. For a while, I was able to repeat the experience of flying or more like floating in my dreams. My dreams aren't always lucid. I'm not always able to control or influence them. And sometimes my dreams can be no fun. I've had terrifying recurring nightmares that continue to stick with me. These experiences always seemed like more to me than just brain noise or the mind fixing errors in the hard drive. As I get older, the more significant and important they seem. I believe more and more dreams represent something deeper. For most of my life, in addition to lucid dreaming, I've also been experiencing events known as night terrors. This specific kind of nightmare is common in children, affecting roughly 40% and perhaps a few percent of adults. This is a fairly widespread phenomenon. The eeriest part is the distinct similarity shared between people's different night terrors. The night terror experience typically involves an entity attacking and feeding off the energy of the dreamer while they're sleeping. Many reports of night terrors show a strange overlap, especially regarding the physical descriptions of these vampiric entities. My recent night terror from a few months ago featured an entity very similar to what has been described by others. In the nightmare, I woke up in bed with a hostile presence standing over me. An extremely old man with gray skin and a single white wisp of hair dangling from the top of his forehead. He's somehow smiling and scowling at the same time. I think to myself, you again. And that's when he attacked. He's much stronger and always overpowers me in the dreams. The entity always seemed to me like some kind of vampire. The hostility in his face before he attacks is always much worse than the actual attacks themselves. As I've gotten older, I've learned to deal with the nightmares. They've become just another interesting variety of dream, sometimes with even more to say. My lucid dreams now come fairly regularly, a few times per week. The most important recurring lucid dream to me involves a strange city by the sea, a place under attack by a strange evil force that sends frequent devastating tsunamis and a university of sorts. Mystery school, I call it. It's populated with historical geniuses, assorted wizards, witches, and warlocks. I'm the worst student in the place. I received a degree about a year ago, but I'm still taking classes in alchemy, physics, and the philosophy of plants. I've even been given a job teaching my first class in the preparation of chemical potions. The other life of my recurring mystery school dreams is much more frightening than the one I share with the Vanadium audience on Earth. There are malicious forces with supernatural technologies and horrifying abilities, regular attacks and threats to my life and well-being. The realm of mystery school is one at war, with an enemy that casts hundred-foot tsunamis to crash and devastate the landscape. However, even though it's scarier, there's more warmth in that world. I'm often scared in these dreams, but at the same time, 
comforted somehow by the feeling of friendship and community all around me. In the dreams, I'm almost never alone, and I always find myself trusting the people around me. Over there, even when I'm sometimes running for my life, I'm very happy. My mystery school dreams have taught me that the most important thing is My mystery school dreams have taught me that the most important thing in life is who surrounds you. It almost doesn't matter what surrounds you. It's the who that counts. I managed to make a few friends over in mystery school. One of the people I hang out with over there is the great scientist Michael Faraday, one of the fathers of electromagnetism from the 1800s. In my dreams, he looks just like he does in the oil paintings and on his Wikipedia page. I looked into what some of my recurring dreams could mean or represent to me. I wondered if there was any way I could learn from the dreams of tidal waves and mystery school. What I discovered was interesting. Psychologists and researchers have come to some agreement that recurrent dreams often metaphorically reflect the emotional concerns of the dreamer. For example, for me, dreaming about a tsunami is common, they say, following trauma. Hmm, I didn't know I was traumatized. The dream tsunami is a typical example of a metaphor that can represent emotions of helplessness and panic experienced in everyday waking life. The bad guys over in the mystery school realm the ones who shake the world and shoot the tidal waves are no joke. I've actually never seen what one looks like over there, but just the thought of whatever these things are strikes terror in everyone. The citizens in that little town by the sea live under a dark cloud. These monsters have some kind of technology that allows them to move at ludicrous speeds. So fast, all you can see is the blur and hear the roar of the coming wave. You don't get much time to get away once you hear it. Because of this, I've drowned hundreds of times in my dreams. Researchers say that people who suffer from a recurring nightmare seem to be stuck in a particular way of anticipating and responding to the dream plot. Therapies have been developed to end this repetition and break the vicious cycle of these recurring nightmares. One technique is to visualize the nightmare while awake and then rewrite it. In other words, we want to modify the narrative by changing one aspect, for example, the end of the dream, to something less horrific. Lucid dreaming may work as a solution. The awareness can be used to drive the nightmare in a new direction. This is what I did. Once, I was able to summon the will to fly over an incoming tidal wave and survive an assault from these high-tech beasts. These concepts have been reflected in the movies as well. One of my favorites from Wes Craven's Nightmare on Elm Street series was about lucid dreaming and taking control of a nightmare. 1987's Nightmare on Elm Street, Dream Warriors, with Patricia Arquette. In the movie, the main character uses lucid dreaming skills to take it to Freddy Krueger. I found out I wasn't the only one suffering from this very unpleasant nightmare. A 2018 study by a research team in Israel found that dreaming of losing one's teeth was not particularly linked to symptoms of anxiety, but rather associated with teeth clenching during sleep, which is something I think I do. I guess I need to go get a night guard or something. Everyone knows sleep is essential to survival, but what happens when dreaming is shut down in some way while sleep is allowed to continue? Turns out this has been studied since the 60s with some very interesting results. William Dement published The Effect of Dream Deprivation in Science in 1960. This is from the abstract. Dream deprivation was accomplished by waking sleeping subjects immediately after the onset of eye movement periods, indicative of dreaming. Data are presented on eight male subjects, 23 to 32 years old. Psychological disturbances, such as anxiety, irritability, and difficulty concentrating developed during the period of dream deprivation. The results have been tentatively interpreted as indicating that a certain amount of dreaming each night is a necessity. It is as though a pressure to dream builds up with the accruing dream deficit during successive dream deprivation nights, a pressure which is first evident in the increasing frequency of attempts to dream and then, during the recovery period, in the marked increase in total dream time and percentage of dream time. 
Further studies have shown that dream content, elicited following the selective deprivation of rapid eye movement sleep, was intensified compared to that elicited under non-deprivation conditions. Dream deprivation also resulted in weight gain, increased irritability, difficulty concentrating, and anxiety. This would seem to fit with another study, this time conducted on rats, which found that REM deprivation increased the rats' levels of pro-inflammatory cytokines, inducing a system-wide inflammatory response. Studies show interrupting REM sleep and dreaming has other troubling results. Often the intensity and emotional impact of the dreams, once started again, is heightened, and has been shown to result in psychological trauma and even psychiatric conditions such as psychosis in some subjects. This is from an article from Lawrence Kuby called The Concept of Dream Deprivation. We know that many dreams are psychonoxious. We know that many people go to bed feeling well and awaken in panic, depression, rage, or in a furor of obsessional compulsive activity. We know that psychotic episodes can be precipitated out of a dream and that during war, soldiers might go to sleep well and awaken in states of acute disorganization of one kind or another and that this can happen in civilian life as well. In other words, there are many psychonoxious elements in the dream process. This article poses an interesting question. The effect of REM dream deprivation, is it detrimental, beneficial, or neutral? This article was written by Isaac Lewin and it was published in 1975. This is from the abstract. Based on the assumption that the mental aspect of REM sleep is an extreme state of divergent thinking, it was hypothesized that the psychological effect of REM deprivation varies on a dimension of creativity versus rote learning. On the creativity pole, REM deprivation has a damaging effect, while on the rote learning pole, it has a beneficial one. The results suggested that REM sleep is not clearly essential for survival and management of normal daily tasks, yet it is necessary for adequate adaptation to new experiences, especially those which cannot be completely comprehended upon first exposure. It's been well known that restriction of total sleep has disastrous results. Acute sleep deprivation is when an individual sleeps less than usual or does not sleep at all for a short period of time, usually lasting only one or two days. Chronic sleep deprivation means an individual routinely sleeps less than the optimal amount for ideal functioning. Chronic sleep deficiency is often confused with the term insomnia. Although both chronic sleep deficiency and insomnia share decreased quantity and quality of sleep as well as impaired function, their difference lies on the ability to fall asleep. Sleep-deprived individuals are able to fall asleep rapidly when allowed, but those suffering from insomnia have difficulty getting to sleep. A chronic sleep-restricted state adversely affects the brain and all cognitive function. However, in a subset of cases, sleep deprivation can paradoxically lead to increased energy and alertness, and even enhanced mood. Although its long-term consequences have never been evaluated, sleep deprivation has been used as a treatment for depression. Few studies have compared the effects of acute total sleep deprivation and chronic partial sleep restriction. A complete absence of sleep over a long period is not frequent in humans unless they suffer from fatal familial insomnia or they have an issue caused by surgery. It appears that brief micro-sleeps cannot be avoided. Long-term sleep deprivation has caused death in lab animals, though. Total sleep deprivation in people may be impossible after a few days because the dream world of the deprived subject begins to blend with the waking world. The dreams find their way, even if it's through hallucination. I've often wondered how many other mental and physical health problems are a result of poor sleep or just interrupted dreaming. It seems to me that the hallucinations occurring in patients who are kept awake can better be understood as an extension of the usual dream phenomena which occur in every individual who is slipping in and out of sleep. When one is extremely tired, one slips in and out of these states with increasing rate. 
and there are quick, dreamlike flashes of images from which one might easily awaken with a start. If one is so tired that this happens repeatedly, the boundary between dream and reality gradually becomes indistinct, fuzzy, until one slips over into a real hallucination or a real dream. Sleep and dreams almost always find their way back. I've gone through periods of insomnia, sometimes for reasons that I couldn't explain away to stress or anxiety, but sleep and dreams always come back. Sometimes a very meaningful dream will follow the worst period of rough sleep. In 1869, Dmitri Mendeleev was obsessed with finding a logical way to organize the chemical elements. It had been preying on his mind for months, resulting in anxiety and sleeplessness. One evening, he wrote the elements' names on a series of index cards, one element on each card. In a sweating frenzy, he then wrote the properties of every element on its corresponding card. From arranging the index cards, he noticed that atomic weight was important in some way but he couldn't find a pattern. Convinced that he was on the verge of discovering something significant, Mendeleev put the cards away for several hours until he finally fell asleep at his desk from total exhaustion. When he awoke, he found that his subconscious mind had done his work for him. A logical arrangement of the elements had come to him, like it had always been there. The periodic table the very same one that all chemists and scientists use today had been delivered courtesy of a dream. Srinivasa Ramanujan was an Indian mathematician with no formal training. He made revolutionary contributions to mathematics, and almost all his claims have been proven correct. He initially developed his own mathematical research in isolation, developing almost 4,000 math theorems on his own. Rubanajan credits his work to the Hindu goddess Namakal and her consort, who would repeatedly visit him in dreams and present him with scrolls of complex mathematical formulas. He would then test and prove them after waking. Niels Bohr is the father of quantum mechanics, and he won the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1922. He developed the Bohr model of the atom, where electrons revolve around the nucleus and can jump from one energy level or orbit to another. These concepts are still part of the standard physical model today. He often spoke of an inspirational dream that led to his discovery of the structure of the atom. Before that, he had been attempting to fit various frameworks for the configuration of the atom. One night, in a dream, he saw electrons spinning around the atom's nucleus like planets revolving around the sun. The next morning, he somehow knew the vision was accurate and immediately went to his lab in search of scientific evidence to support his dream. The 19th century German chemist, Frederick Kekulé, is famous for having discovered the structure of benzene and by extension, the structure of all aromatic compounds. In his day, there was no microscopy and no technical way to visualize molecular structures so they had to be deduced from chemical properties. Kekulé says that he had a strange daydream where he saw a snake trying to swallow its own tail. And this was the inspiration for discovery of the ring structure of benzene. The snake eating its own tail is a religious and mythological symbol of many ancient cultures known as the Ouroboros. He also said that in his dream, molecules and atoms were swirling in a giddy dance. Another notable example of dream powers is Rene Descartes. He had a series of three visions on the night of 11th November, 1619, where he says, a divine spirit revealed to him a new intellectual discipline, combining mathematics and philosophy into a new hybrid, which he called analytical geometry. Through these visions, he also discovered that all truths are linked. Descartes also had imaginary conversations with someone he called evil demon. In meditations on first philosophy, Descartes described this entity as clever and deceitful as he is powerful. He has directed his entire effort to misleading me. Descartes employed what he learned from the evil demon as a method of systematic doubt, where we must doubt even our own senses, which could be deceived. 
This was taken from the title page of Meditations by Descartes. The goal is to use doubt as a way of obtaining knowledge about things one cannot doubt. This is where I think therefore I am comes from. Descartes tried to doubt his own existence, but the fact he was doubting proved that he existed. When Albert Einstein was a child, he had a vivid dream that would influence the course of his life. Einstein describes this dream, which he said occurred between 1890 and 1895. Einstein recounts, I was sledding with my friends at night. I started to slide down the hill, but my sled started going faster and faster. I was going so fast that I realized I was approaching the speed of light. I looked up at some point and I saw the stars. They were being refracted into colors I had never seen before. I was filled with a sense of awe. I understood in some way that I was looking at the most important meaning in my life. The dream was an inspiration for what was to become the theory of relativity. Einstein says that his entire scientific career was a meditation on this dream. To me, a vision is a supernatural experience that discloses information through insight or revelation. Visions are linked to religious and spiritual traditions, but they're universal. We're all dreamers. We're all visionaries. From our dreams, we cannot escape. Empirical and rational knowledge are important, but the intuitive data that bubbles up from just under our awareness is necessary for any innovation or revolution. The unconscious can tackle complex problems. Dreams, daydreams, and even visions have shaped and moved the world. It is through science that we prove, but through intuition that we discover. By Henri Poincaré. Thank you very much. This was Chris Rankin with Vanadium.